Today's webinar is entitled, Eating Competence Makes Eating a Reasonable Adventure. And our presenter is Dr. Barbara Lose, a professor of health sciences and the head of the Wegman School of Health and Nutrition. Dr. Lose has spent her career researching nutrition and eating behaviors and developing nutrition educational strategies to enhance nutritional status, especially for those with limited incomes and food insecurity. A native of Minnesota, Dr. Losey received a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology and Chemistry from the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, a Master's degree in Foods and Nutrition from the University of Wisconsin, Stout, and a PhD in Nutritional Science and Educational Psychology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. A registered dietitian with clinical experience with patients living with developmental and psychiatric disabilities, she's also the director of the Nutrition Education Engineering and Design Center. Prior to coming to RIT, she was a research professor and principal investigator of the SNAP-Ed program at the Pennsylvania State University. Welcome, Dr. Lose, and let's get started. Thank you very much, Tamara. Um, so just in case somebody's having any trouble or isn't able to hear me, I encourage you to use the chat box and let us know because we certainly want to to be sure that everybody is able to, to hear us. So thank you all for joining, and uh, I encourage you to um, send in questions uh, during the uh, presentation as well as afterwards. You can always send me an email at RIT, and I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, even after the webinar. So today I'm going to talk about eating competence. But I first want to mention the fact that we are a new school at RIT. The Wegman School of Health and Nutrition was uh, formed last year, and we are in a new location on the western edge of campus. And in the school, we have exercise science and nutrition management and um, are working on developing some graduate programs. And so we have. Uh, a little bit of information, uh, because I know this is a new school and a lot of alumni uh, are not familiar with it. Our vision is that scholars, students, and citizens will walk the talk to secure health for all. And our mission is to engineer effective health and nutrition education to be a reasonable adventure. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on what a reasonable adventure is. But basically, we want the information, the education to be feasible, sustainable, compelling, and rewarding. Our strategic plan is to develop new degree programs, specifically looking at graduate degree programs. We have our Nutrition Education Engineering and Design Center, which, through which we develop educational materials for organizations, for students, uh, for uh, government entities, and of course through research funding. We also want to partner with stakeholders that are in business and government so that you know where you can go if you want to get some sound sources of nutrition education. We also want to collaborate with researchers and practitioners that are engaged in clinical research in the Rochester and surrounding area as well as beyond. And then, of course, look at policy development both at the county, state, and federal levels to support efforts in health and nutrition education. I will just put in a plug that there's a huge Child Nutrition Authorization Act that's being uh, looked at by Congress now. I encourage all of you to take a look at it if you're interested in nutrition and health because it has a lot of implications for nutrition education. The objectives of this particular presentation are that you will be able to describe eating competence, identify how it relates to health and well-being, and apply eating competence principles to your own food styles. So I'm going to kind of jump in here, and I'm going to be giving quite a bit of information, and that's why I'm encouraging you to maybe come back and re-look at the presentation, go through it a little bit more slowly, and you may even want to email me some questions later. So first of all, eating, one of our most favorite topics. I think it's close to lunchtime here in Rochester. And uh, what do people really want when we're talking about eating? Importantly, the research all shows that people want to eat food they enjoy, but they also want to eat enough, not too much, not too little, depending upon where they are at. They want to also enjoy eating with other people, and we want to feel good about it. We want to feel positive, 
and we want to feel very effective in terms of feeding our children. Many, many times we hear uh, parents don't think much about eating until they actually have a small person that they want to be able to, to feed, and how should they actually do it? Well, that's really what eating competence is about. Uh, the operational definition of eating competence is an intra-individual approach, meaning within yourself, to eating and food-related attitudes and behaviors, both attitude and both what you actually do, that entrains positive biopsychosocial outcomes. So it seems like a, a little bit of a complex definition, but it is important in that it's very personally related. And it's, and it's involving having outcomes. So it's, it's not just how you're thinking, but the fact that you actually do some things differently. And I think this is very important for this reason. In the field of nutrition, you hear so much about what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, how you should eat, and there's all these rules and regulations. And the idea behind eating competence is that eating should be fun. Eating should be something that doesn't scare you. Eating should be something that doesn't uh, make you nervous or anxious. And there, are, there is an approach, an eating competent approach, through which we have been able to show is actually related to the health outcomes that we're all truly interested in. So competent eaters are matter of fact and reliable about getting enough to eat of enjoyable and nourishing food. They're very positive and flexible with eating. And they actually have self-trust that they're going to be able to eat satisfying amounts of rewarding food to maintain a stable body weight, something that a lot of people are involved in and interested in with respect to their eating. Is it going to make them gain weight or lose weight? And there's a way to measure eating competence. And in fact, most of the research that I'm going to share with you following this is based upon the results from using the Satter Eating Competence Inventory. Satter Eating Competence Inventory is named after Ellen Satter, who's a psychotherapist in Madison, who uh, has actually done a lot of clinical work uh, developing the eating competence construct. In this particular inventory, uh, people answer questions uh, as always, often, sometimes, rarely, or never. And I'm just showing uh, you here that we've done quite a bit of psychometrics with the instrument. Um, their scores can range from 0 to 48. We've done factor analyses. There are four subscales, which I'm going to go over in more detail. We, the subscales have the right kind of re internal reliability, as well as we have found that there's test-retest reliability. Now, these are all uh, statistics and factors that we use to show that this is a pertinent instrument and a valid instrument to use in research. So in the EC Satter Inventory, as we call it, the four subscales uh, include eating attitudes and behaviors. And these are the, the statements that are in the eating attitudes and behaviors uh, subscale. So for example, somebody would read, I am relaxed about eating, and they would say whether they always feel this way, often, sometimes, rarely, or never. I am comfortable about eating enough. I enjoy food and eating. I am comfortable with my enjoyment of food and eating. I feel it's okay to eat food that I like. It's all about attitudes and behaviors. The internal regulation of intake subscale is I trust myself to eat enough for me. I eat as much as I am hungry for. I eat until I feel satisfied. That you're able to actually self-regulate the amount of food that you, uh, that you want to take in. Food acceptance has to do with experimenting with food making do by eating food you don't really care for, but there's not something else around that you, that you would normally want to eat, and eating a wide variety of foods. And eating context is the uh, subscale that most nutritionists focus on when they're doing uh, nutrition education. I tune into food and pay attention to eating, making time to eat, having regular meals, considering what is good for me. You know, they're looking a little bit at nutrition and planning for feeding myself. A lot of nutrition education includes these concepts. So when you go back and you look at these particular items, the eating attitudes and behaviors, the internal regulation of intake, food acceptance, and eating context, I'd just like to point out there's not one question in here about weight. There isn't one question in here about 
fruits and vegetables, or particular nutrients, vitamin C, vitamin A, or iron. This is all related to your attitudes and your behaviors towards eating. And I, I make this point because of the findings that I'm going to be showing you next. So we have done a lot of research with this particular construct. We've done uh, 23 studies. In fact, we are finishing up three more. And we have done these studies with uh, samples that are both male, that are both female, uh, or that are just male or just female, or that are both male and female, college students, seniors, general populations. We have had some that are only low income. Uh, we've had some that have had a chronic disease or no chronic disease, preschool age, elementary age, general age for children, and uh, mostly in Pennsylvania, because as Tamara told you, I came from Penn State, but other states too um, in the United States, as well as a study that was done in Spain. And I will point out now that the eating competence inventory has been translated into Chinese, Spanish, uh, Finnish, um, and Latvian, and Japanese. And there's a lot of research going on in the Scandinavian countries now with eating competence. So there will be more studies even coming out. But what I'm hoping to do for you today is to paint a picture of eating competence because I do think it is both a science and an art in terms of looking at what the data actually show, and then an art of what, what does this actually mean for nutrition education? What does it mean for medical practice or clinical practice? So the parameters that, that we've examined that I'm going to talk about relate to physical activity, cardiovascular risk, dietary intake, sleep behavior, parenting behaviors, eating behaviors, body mass index or BMI, food security, and then demographics related to age and gender and intervention outcomes. And when you think about when you're doing health research or you're thinking about your eating for health, these are really the things you're thinking about, right? Your weight, your cardiovascular risk, your sleep behavior, whether you're eating healthfully. And yet remember, there's nothing in those items that I asked in the eating competence survey about sleep, about diet, about specific nutrients. So the first thing we're going to look at is physical activity. In general, the concluding statement is that persons who are eating competent are more frequently perceived themselves as being physically active. And also, the VO2 max, which has, is a measure of fitness, shows that persons who are eating competent are actually more fit. We are finishing a study up now in Colorado in which we are having parents wearing accelerometers so that we are having a, an objective measure of physical activity as opposed to where people perceive how physically active they are. Those data we're actually still uh, collecting. But what we can show so far, just from perception of eating competence, shows that, uh, for example, in this one study where we had 512 women, mostly white, a uh, mix of education levels, 60% of them were SNAP. SNAP is the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's the new name for food stamps. 61% were overweight or obese, and they were about 31 years of age in terms of uh, average age. And look at here. The... Um, the physically active group, the group that perceived that they were physically active, 44% of them were actually eating competent, which means they scored 32 or higher on that eating competence survey. Whereas the group that did not perceive themselves as physically active, only 22% were eating competent. And when you look at the group that felt that they were physically active, 40% were in the high eating competence tertile, whereas of only about half of those who were not physically active we're in the eating competence tertile. And the score, the score can range from zero to 48. The higher your score, the more eating competent you are. The group that was not physically active, score of just under 25, whereas the physically active group has a score of 30. And these are all statistically significant. Uh, we controlled for weight satisfaction and BMI. Another study, 832 uh, college students from 33 different states. Um, and, um, oh, I have to change that back. This is 832 that were general from 33 different states. 55% of them had a college degree, and they were about 37 years of age. So a very different type of sample. And in this case, those who were physically active 
40, were 43 percent less likely to be in the lowest eating confidence quartile. The physically active were 1.67 times more likely to be eating confident. So it, even in this general population that was not definitely, you know, that did not have such low income uh, women and they were a little bit older and they were a little bit more educated, we found the exact same thing. Uh, here is 506 Pennsylvania women, 68% overweight or obese, 61% food insecure. Under half, um, uh, around half, had no post high school education. The same thing again here, that those who were, um, uh, in this case, not physically active, only 44%, or that were not eating competent, only 44% said they were physically active. And this is the uh, second time that we did the study. We, uh, the red just shows you that we got the exact same type of, of a range of answers. Those who were eating competent, 66% felt that they were physically active. And when you look at the tertile again, those who were in the high eating competence tertile, 66% felt they were physically active, whereas only 39% in the low eating competence tertile. So the point being that there is, there's really, uh, we're seeing this over and over and over again in different samples. Now here's my group, my college students. 1,689 college students from colleges in eight states. They were 79% uh, white. They were all um, um, college age. Uh, nearly uh, three-fourths were between 18 and 19 years of age. And again, the same thing here in that the group that was behaviorally competent, there was a cluster analysis done, and they were behaviorally competent. Look, they were much more physically active by measuring with an international physical activity questionnaire. Their met minutes were much higher. In fact, nearly triple higher than, um, than uh, some that were uh, considered to be high risk in terms of their eating. One more thing here in the physically active uh, um, uh, discussion here. This is only women. And we asked them if they considered themselves to be a physically active person. And so the people who said yes, which are the green bar, even when you look, we divided them up as to whether they were under or normal weight, overweight, or obese. And even when they were obese, if they considered themselves to be physically active, you can see that their eating confidence score, which is on this vertical axis, was still higher than the people who did not consider themselves to be physically active but were normal weight. And so here, even when you, can, when you separate out the weight category, the physically active people still have a higher eating competence score. And the same when we ask them if they're eating, if they're physically active for more than 30 minutes. Those who are physically active more than 30 minutes, even if they're obese, they have a higher eating competence score than those who are under normal weight or overweight. So physical activity has been, is really important, right, for our health. And one of the reasons is because it seems to kind of go along with cardiovascular disease risk. And we all know that lots of times we're physically active to try to ward off our risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, eating competence has also been associated with biomarkers of reduced cardiovascular disease risk. It hasn't been shown real consistently because we've had many different types of research samples, and we want to do additional research. And I'm hoping that we can give this eating competence inventory in large national surveys, such as the Nutrition Health and the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, as well as some other um, uh, regional surveys that are, that are being done for health purposes. Let me just show you an example here. We had 48 um, subjects. 19 males, 29 females. They ranged in age from 21 to 70, and they had a, a BMI that was considered overweight, just a little bit above normal weight. And yet when we correlated uh, some parameters with the eating confidence score, we have quite a few uh, significant and, ten and trends towards significance. So for example, HDL cholesterol, you've heard of that as the good cholesterol. It's a significant correlation with the eating confidence score. Um, resting blood or blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. The higher your blood pressure, the lower your eating competence score. Same with resting diastolic blood pressure and blood pressure that has been, you've been stressed. They do these uh, stress tests to try to see how high they can raise the blood pressure. And so even with the speech test, uh, blood pressure stress test, 
The higher your systolic blood pressure, the lower your eating competence score. And then the triglycerides. The higher your triglycerides, the lower the eating competence score. And even measures of inflammation, markers of inflammation, interleukin-1 and the SV cams, the higher they were, in other words, the more markers of inflammation, the lower your eating competence score. And then, of course, that's reversed. The lower your markers of inflammation, which is what we want, the higher your eating competence score. So all in the directions that we're looking toward. Compared to an eating competent participant, the participants who were not eating competent were five times more likely to have an LDL cholesterol greater than 130. And the participants not eating competent were seven times more likely for the triglycerides to be greater than 150. Now remember, we, have, we don't even ask them anything about you know, their blood work in, on this survey. We aren't asking them anything about the amount of fat they consume, nothing just their approach to eating and how they plan for eating, how relaxed they are about eating. Do they eat a variety of foods? Do they pay attention to their eating? This is just the chart showing the blood pressure work. So in this case, this is the systolic blood pressure. So at all cases, the red, which is the high eating competence, at all cases, normally in stress tests, speech uh, stress tests, the cold stress tests, their blood pressure is lower. And the same with the diastolic. The red, which is the high eating competence, their blood pressure is always lower and it's significantly lower um, than those who have low eating competence. Also looking at the cardiovascular risk, this was a group of Spanish uh, elderly who actually had to have at least one risk of cardiovascular disease. And the group that was not eating competent, there was only a trend to have a little bit higher BMI, but not very much difference. They had the, no difference in waist circumference, but there was a trend for them to have a higher LDL. They had a significantly lower HDL, and they had a significantly higher glucose level. The participants were 1.7 times more likely to be eating competent with having an HDL greater than 40 milligrams. Okay? So it's, it's interesting. This is another typical, uh, you know, different, totally different sample. This is the um, chart showing this, that when you have, and like in this case, glucose, this is the odds ratio 0.71. In other words, the people who had, um, they would have a 29% less likelihood of having a high glucose if they were eating competent. In this case, they would have a 30% uh, less likelihood of having a um, low HDL if they were eating competent. So this is just another way of showing the same type of, of, of topic, that there appears to be a relationship that if you're eating competent, your, your, your cardiovascular risk factors are lower. So I'm in the field of nutrition, and what people always ask is, okay, all this makes sense, but I really care about what people eat and how their quality of diet is. So what if they're more relaxed? Okay, maybe they would have a a low H, uh, uh, LDL and a high HDL anyway, I want to know what it is that they're, what their diet is saying. So we've done some studies with diet. We did some early studies and we found that fewer um, competent eaters were actually in the pre-action stages of change. And we also showed that competent eaters were more apt to report in, uh, enjoying cooking, spending time cooking and shopping, and they had stronger resource management skills. Um, Subsequent studies, we've actually been able to show this, um, that we had a study of low-income adults that were recruited using Facebook. And uh, so we had a huge you know, United States population to, to be able to recruit from. And this showed that eating competent persons tended to make more healthy and low-fat foods compared to those that weren't eating competent, really almost double more often. And uh, Dawn Clifford uh, did a study, and she showed that perceived diet quality was very important in a regression model that, to predict eating competence scores. And in fact, uh, in a sample of 1,700, those who perceived having a higher diet quality actually had a higher eating competence score. We did a study with parents of fourth graders who were, who were more than three-fourths of them were Hispanic, 89% of them were female, and looking at fruit and vegetable availability. And the parents who were eating competent had a significantly higher number of fruit and vegetables available than those that were not eating competent. 
And when we looked at those who were below the median in terms of fruit and vegetable availability, they had a lower eating competence score than those who were above the median in terms of fruit and vegetable availability. Also, we did a study where we used the Penn State Diet Assessment Center and did um, multiple paths of 24-hour recalls, uh, which is an approved uh, research method for gathering dietary information. We had 149 women that were recruited from FNAP and SNAP, which are low-income nutrition education programs. The half of them were, were white and about half were black and uh, mostly female. They took in a very normal calorie level a day, 1,620 calories, very normal amount of percent from fat. And when we compared non-eating competent to eating competent women, and we adjusted for calories, the eating competent women had, um, uh, uh, we looked at their intakes of the eating competent women had greater intakes of fiber, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, the B vitamins, they had more magnesium, more iron, more zinc, more potassium, and they had a higher healthy eating index score. Now this really got the attention of people. Remember I said we never asked anybody about their food that they actually ate. And so here when you look at eating confidence scores, they were actually higher um, and they had higher dietary quality. We also did a factor analysis and found that there were two patterns of dietary intake. Pattern one, they had a lower healthy eating score. They had more refined grains, added fats, sweetened beverages, fried foods, whole fat foods, and um, there was no correlation with eating competence. But in the pattern two, which was had a higher healthy eating index score, they had dark green vegetables, more fruits, more whole grains, more tomatoes, there was a significant correlation with being eating competent. So as you could tell, this was pretty exciting to, to our research group. In the uh, elderly, elderly Spaniards that, were, uh, that I mentioned earlier, we also looked at their dietary intake and we had, again, a, a, a research sound method of, of collecting dietary data. And after adjusting for energy and gender, the eating competent had higher intakes of um, fruit, they had higher intake of fish, and they had higher intake of omega-3 fats. And importantly, they also had greater adherence to the Mediterranean diet, using the, Med the validated Mediterranean diet scale. We all have been hearing about the Mediterranean diet, right? You just need to go into your favorite food market and you see the promotion of the Mediterranean diet with uh, olives and um, fresh fruits and vegetables and lean meats and nuts and focus on meals, focus on enjoying eating. And here we found that people who were eating competent were more likely to adhere to the Mediterranean diet. And of course, that's been important because the Mediterranean diet is associated with less cardiovascular risk and in a recent study, even decreased mortality. So it's really getting down to looking at the Mediterranean diet being quite a healthy diet. Now, the hot topic is sleep. Uh, research is showing that sleep is more valuable than we actually ever thought. And in fact, there are, there are policy changes being made with respect to school days and um, timing for truck drivers and pilots, et cetera. And sleep is showing to be very important in overall health. And our cross-sectional data show that having eight or more hours of sleep a night is associated with greater eating competence. For example, um, there was uh, our study of 1,252 college students that had a, a, their BMI. They were very healthy, um, their mean age of 19. And we looked at, we divided them, we measured sleep using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And we uh, looked at those who had uh, less than seven hours of sleep, seven to eight, and eight or more hours of sleep. And we were able to show that the eating confidence those who had eight or more hours of sleep had a significantly higher level of, of eating competence, and their, their eating attitudes were, were higher, their internal regulation, in other words, their ability to monitor, maintain what they ate, eat until they were satisfied, not overeat, um, was higher, and their binge eating, as measured by a binge eating scale, um, was much lower. Of course, we controlled here for gender and race, um, we controlled for having a negative affect, in other words, a, a depression, having some depression 
and sleep disturbances. So we, we filter out all the variables that might actually explain these differences. And even when we filtered all of those out, we still had higher eating confidence scores in those that had eight or more hours of sleep, less binge eating, higher eating attitudes, and higher internal regulation. So we are actually carrying on some more studies about sleep because it's so valuable and important. And uh, if any of you out there are listening and you do sleep research or you have uh, um, some sort of a clinic or something where you are able to, to add in the eating competence survey into what you, um, the instruments that you give your patients or the, the surveys that you give your patients, you should get in touch with me because I would be very interested the eating competence survey takes less than six minutes to complete. It's very, very simple to complete. It's got a, a, a elementary school uh, reading level. And so I encourage you, if you're listening and you do this type of research or you have this type of a practice, to get in touch with me. I'd really like to be able to collaborate with you. So now looking at parenting. You know, we're all interested in, are we feeding our children correctly? Are we going to ruin their health? Are we going to give them bad eating habits? Um, and so parenting is, is a, a really important uh, concept uh, in terms of looking at adult eating patterns and in terms of what adults can do to help their children. We have been able to show that parents who are eating competent actually demonstrate reliable mealtime structure. They have self-efficacy for serving fruits and vegetables. In other words, they know that they can serve fruits and vegetables that their children will eat and that they will like. They actually have more fruits and vegetables available in their home. And so here's a, a, a couple of examples. We, um, we asked the question, how often do you eat breakfast with your child? And this is from a survey that has been used frequently with children. It's been validated. It's been tested in other studies. The research that we do at the Wegman School of Health and Nutrition is evidence-based. It, uh, we don't use um, instruments that haven't been tested. We, we use methods that um, we, we know we're going to be able to have some sound evidence-based outcomes that will really help the field of nutrition as well as health. So in this case, how often do you eat breakfast with your child? The parent could say never, sometimes, often, or always. And then we looked at the parent's eating competence levels. So the dark uh, band on the bottom here shows that the parents who said always, there was a higher proportion of them that were eating competent than the parents who said never. And it's very interesting that there's this stepwise increase here, that if you sometimes eat breakfast with your children, a little bit more eating competent parents than those who say never, but a little bit less than those who say often. And it's a significant association. There was also a trend, P equals 0.07, when asking them how many days each week do you usually prepare meals together with your child. And so again, we still had though, if there was four to seven days, there was a trend for there to be a higher proportion of eating competent parents. We asked, how often do you eat dinner with your child? And the same thing, there was a higher proportion of eating competent parents that said always, that they always eat dinner with their child compared to parents who said never or sometimes. And again, a stepwise increase. How often do you eat vegetables at dinner with your child? Exact same thing, a trend. But I mean, it's not a trend, it's significant, but it's a stepwise increase in that eating vegetables at dinner with your child, if you always did this, more eating confidence. Um, how often do you eat fruit at dinner with your child? Again, the exact same thing. So this wasn't just one question. This was a whole host of questions in which there was a relationship that eating competent parents are more likely to do this. And why would you think that? Um, we have the questions. How often do you plan meals? How often do you pay attention to eating? How, about, how do, you consider, do you consider what is good for you when you eat? So all of these questions are, this is where we're seeing the responses, that these are parents who do plan meals. These are parents who do think about nutrition. But they're also parents who enjoy eating and who are as interested in the eating environment as they are in what they actually serve. And so we did a cluster analysis and found that their parents could be divided into two groups, a group that we called achievers. In other words, they ate dinner with their child 
ate breakfast with their child more frequently. They modeled, they had role modeling behaviors. They had, they were, had a, a high self-efficacy in being able to serve fruits and vegetables for their children. And they had fruits and vegetables available. And then we had the group that was, I call the strivers. And they were lower, significantly lower on all of these parameters. And when you looked at the eating confidence score, the strivers, only a score of 30.3, whereas the achievers, 34.9. And remember I said that a score of 32 or higher is considered eating confident. So we had many more eating confident parents in the achievers group than in the strivers group. So one of the things that I bring this up is because we're talking about what does this mean. And what, what it relates to is that instead of just trying to teach parents how to shop for food or just teaching them how to prepare food or how to use a shopping list or um, uh, how, to, how to make sure that their child's getting enough nutrients, we probably should be focusing a lot more on how to help parents feel good about eating, to enjoy their eating, to be relaxed about their eating, to feel comfortable about what they're eating, to, to make do with the foods that's available. In fact, in the eating competence construct, uh, Ellen Satter says that uh, it's actually better if you eat as a family, but what you eat as a family every night isn't what would be considered tremendously healthy, uh, as opposed to eating one really healthy meal together as a family and the rest of the nights you're not really eating together. That getting that mealtime structure, the conversation going, enjoying the company of each other, being sociable, that that's really important. And in fact, we've done some research with eating disorders. And the eating disorders um, work shows that people who are um, more prone to, to bulimia, more prone to having a, a drive to diet or a drive to thinness or fear of being overweight are also less eating competent. And so there's all these, all these factors that play into actually being healthy that don't have to do with teaching about nutrients, that don't have to do with teaching about what is the portion size of food that your two-year-old needs. Sometimes teaching about the idea of how to enjoy eating with your two-year-old is actually more important. We have done some research with preschoolers. Unfortunately, the timing of this, I, I really could talk all afternoon uh, on this topic from some of the studies that we've done but the research that we've done with researchers actually shows that the uh, um, parents who are eating competent, their, their children have a higher quality of life as measured by validated quality of life surveys. So now BMI, strange but true, BMI is not really related uh, to eating competence. And even when we control for gender. And when there is any type of a slight relationship it always is that the BMI, people who are eating competent have a much healthier BMI. And this is good because a lot of people will say, well, hey, wait a minute. If you're not so focused on what you eat and your portion sizes and what you should weigh, you know, if you just are tuned into your own internal, internal eating and you eat until you're satisfied, you're going to be way overweight. And I can say that the research has not shown that. If you can be tuned in to eating until you're satisfied, you're actually going to have a much healthier weight. And not focus so much on, well, let's see, I had a, I really liked what I ate for lunch, so I had a little too much, so I'm going to skip dinner. That kind of mentality is actually associated with poorer health. Um, Don Clifford, in her study with college students that I mentioned earlier, she noted that it was weight satisfaction. And, and not desiring to lose weight that were more predictive of eating confidence than BMI. And in the PREDIMED study, which is a study with the senior Spaniards, the likelihood of being eating confident decreased by 5% unit increase in BMI. So um, uh, it, it is very interesting that BMI, the research shows that BMI is actually either no different or it's actually a little bit lower when you are eating confident. Age by itself does not really appear to be associated with eating competent, competence, which is an interesting uh, factor. Um, like I'll give you an example. These are along the sides a whole bunch of studies, and this is the number that's in the study, like 1,689 is in the first side. 
And um, so in this case, the, they're 18 to 19 year olds and their mean eating confidence score was 31. Whereas then you go down to have somebody who is a mean age of 36, their eating confidence score is also 31. And then you have somebody here who has a mean age of 30.7, their eating confidence score is 28.9, so it's lower. So there's, it, it, in some studies we've shown that as you get older, the eating confidence score gets slightly higher, and part of that is related to the fact that you just get a few more meal planning skills. You know a little bit more how to um, make meals, and so you're a little bit more relaxed about eating. But that's the only thing that's related to age that we've been able to tease out. Otherwise, eating confidence is something that can young, very young people can have, and that um, and people that and also people can get it as they get a little bit older. And this is kind of an interesting point to think about because um, it, it, it makes education very interesting. We can't just assume that all young people are not going to be eating confident because that is just not the data do not show that. Gender, males have a tendency to be more eating confident than women, and uh, this hasn't been shown in all studies, but in some studies. And the biggest uh, reason, you can probably guess why, is that men tend to have higher scores on the eating attitude subscale. In other words, they're more apt to say, I enjoy eating, I'm relaxed about eating, I'm comfortable with my eating, I think it's okay to eat what I like, I'm actually comfortable with my enjoyment of eating. And um, also uh, than women. Women just tend to not have higher scores uh, for some reason, have not, do not feel as relaxed about eating. The contextual scale scores contribute the most and the eating attitude scores the least, the female eating competence scores. So the contextual scale scores are things like I plan meals, I pay attention to uh, food when I'm, uh, to myself when I'm eating, I think about what's good for me when I'm eating. The females tend to be a little bit higher on those scores. But uh, by far and large, the men will have a little bit higher score than females. And in some studies, we've actually had to control for gender, but we, when we've controlled for gender, we come up then with the same outcomes in terms of cardiovascular risk, being uh, lower in eating competent persons, sleep being of a better quality, diet being of a better quality, parenting skills being um, higher. So this slide, I'm just giving you some references um, uh, for the uh, studies that we've actually done. Um, and uh, in case uh, you want to go and look at them or look more at the uh, research, and you can see that we've had um, quite a few uh, different journals that we've published in. The last one there, number 22, which is set in review, I, I haven't... Uh, updated this, uh, we just last week uh, got this study uh, uh, published, accepted into um, a peer-reviewed journal. And so there's a, a lot of research that's been published about eating competence, and, um, and I know of some papers that are actually coming out that are, that are um, going to be contributing and adding to this. So now I wanted to just mention, I, I entitled this uh, 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 talk, uh, eating confidence uh, makes eating a reasonable adventure. And I like to come back around to a reasonable adventure because RIT, of course, is an institution of higher education. And a reasonable adventurer is a term that was developed by Roy Heath in 1964. And he did a study with men in Princeton uh, who started Princeton in 1954 and graduated in 1959. And he followed them through all of their college career and was trying to see what, what factors actually could be attached to college graduates who were extremely successful, not just financially, but that they enjoyed life, they had a good job, they, they had a good quality of life. And he was able to, um, uh, over uh, several years of analysis, to identify one particular cluster. And this cluster he called the reasonable adventurer, which, you know, in a way is kind of an oxymoron type of term. And uh, he actually said that a university that is not developing reasonable adventurers is not involved in higher education. 
And so whenever I've taught classes or I'm doing my research, I'm really thinking about am I developing a reasonable adventurer or am I doing research that's going to contribute to knowledge that will help develop a reasonable adventurer. So um, if you look at the six attributes of a reasonable adventurer, intellectuality, they're the ability to alternate between being a believer and a skeptic. They're able to be curious and yet determine what matters, kind of approaching things from a, of a scientific perspective. Reasonable adventurers form close relationships. They can discover people and realize that they have shared feelings with other people. Importantly, they have an independence in their value judgments. They rely on personal experience and not just what the crowd is saying, what the external authorities are saying. They rely upon their own judgment. They also have a tolerance for ambiguity. They can view life as, um, you know, going to have its ups and downs. And they may need to actually suspend their judgment about some situations until they have a little bit more information to do so. That idea of suspending judgments until sufficient information is obtained is really a critical thinking um, tenet. And it's something that RIT is very involved in is um, critical thinking and having a critical thinking approach um, to students not only in their uh, classes, but in all of the activities that occur at, um, at RIT. Reasonable adventurers have a breadth of interest, uh, uncommon interest in, uh, in the commonplace, and are involved in a lot of different ideas. And then finally, a sense of humor, so that they can look at the things, you know, don't they, they take life seriously, but they realize that there is humor in things, and that sometimes a sense of humor will help you be a little bit more sensitive, it will help you to handle conflict, and, and helping you to, to look at uh, things from a different, from a critical perspective. And so in terms of applying this then, a reasonable adventure, and probably I, I think a lot of you out there are listening to an RIT alumni webinar, probably look at this and realize you're reasonable adventurers. And uh, how does this fit then with eating confidence? Well. Eating confidence, uh, looking at intellectuality. That's really looking at the contextual skills, that you're able to be able to learn new things, that you're able to learn how to cook, how to shop, how to have new recipes, how to read new nutrition information, how to uh, pay attention to yourself, how to make good eating environments, how to have new table environments, how to, to, to master the fact that maybe your favorite uh, news show is on at 6 o'clock when you really want to eat. How do you master that, that uh, conflict? How do, you, how do you look at it and make a, a judgment about how you can um, adjust your life so that the contextual skills will remain high? Uh, reasonable adventurers are able to form close friendships. And I think this relates to internal regulation and food acceptance. You're able to accept food. You're able to see the individuality of each in food. You're not just a one vegetable person. You like to try all different kinds of vegetables. And also, um, you're able to um, be friends with yourself. You are, you can internally, you can think about what you really need, what you really want. You have interoceptive awareness. Independence and value judgment. Again, that relates to internal regulation. That you can go by what you think is enough for you to eat and not just because that's the amount somebody is serving you, or that's what society says, or that's what the food, uh, my, my plate says, or the uh, food experts say that is the amount that you should eat. You go according to what you know that you need and what is good for you and your body and your activity level and your, your weight and your, your desires. Sense of humor has to do with eating attitudes. You enjoy life. You enjoy a food. You enjoy eating. You're relaxed about it. You uh, can look at uh, things uh, from a humorous perspective in terms of, of um, be thinking it's okay to eat what you really want to eat. Rest of interest has to do with food acceptance, that you, you're interested in a lot of different foods. You're interested in a lot of uh, ways to prepare food. You're um, interested in um, uh, being able to try new cooking styles, try new restaurants. Uh, and then finally, able to tolerate ambiguity. Because sometimes we don't really know what's the right um, amount to eat 
or we don't know if this is really going to work out. We don't really know um, if uh, uh, the, the, you know, the nutrition education or the nutrition knowledge that's out there changes so frequently. And so we can tolerate ambiguity. We can decide to change what we shop for. We can decide to, to change the meal, uh, the menu, because of a change in the knowledge that's out there. We have contextual skills to be able to do so. The same with our eating attitudes. We are able to tolerate the, the ambiguity of, 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 of really uh, what is the best eating style. And so I, uh, I, there's not really a test for being a reasonable adventurer. There is a survey that Dr. Heath used to develop, uh, to learn whether somebody was a reasonable adventurer. But we haven't really been able to, I haven't been able to sh give somebody a reasonable adventure survey and an eating confidence survey and correlate the two scores. But I think if you, uh, we probably could do a study where we would interview people and actually see how they, how they responded to um, some of the tenets of, of being a reasonable adventure. But I think it's, it's clear that being a reasonable adventurer is affiliated with the, the concepts, the construct of, having, of being eating competent. And both of these are related to having a good quality of life and being able to be healthy, uh, both physically as well as emotionally. And in the bottom line, isn't that what we're interested in? Isn't that, isn't that what we're striving towards? is to have a good quality of life. I mean, I as a nutritionist, I'm not striving towards having somebody eat only 20% of their calories from fat. I, I'm really striving for them to have a healthy quality of life, perhaps to have less risk of cardiovascular disease and, um, and looking for the ways in which that can be done. And so if striving to have somebody be eating competent is actually going to help them have a better quality of diet, and less risk of cardiovascular disease, then I think that my clinical practice and my research and my education are going to strive towards helping to somebody to be uh, eating competent. And so um, I'll leave you with that. And um, uh, I think at this point, oh, I have one last slide here. Very good, I forgot here. Um, this last slide is, um, uh, I, I had the uh, good fortune of being able to go to um, Croatia recently. And um, it's interesting, RIT actually has a campus in Croatia. And when I was on, um, I went to this um, uh, you know, museum that was there, and in Lombarda, um, Corcula, there was at 300 BC a sophisma, and uh, this is on a stone tablet. And a sophisma is a legal decision that's made by a popular assembly. This is 300 BC. And this translates basically to let all be decided with happiness. And I think that's what we really are striving for at the Wegman School of Health and Nutrition in terms of health and nutrition education is that we're really wanting that decisions to be made uh, in the best interest of everybody and so that people are happy with the decisions that are made. And again, that fits in with the concept of eating confidence, that we're really striving to have a happy outcome. So with that, let's, if you have some questions now, I'll be happy to, to try to respond to them. And again, if you want to email me something later, I'll be happy to respond to you then too. So thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Dr. Lose. We actually do have um, somebody that has a question for you. Mm -hmm. Thomas wrote in and he had a great motivation to lose 73 pounds because his first grandchild, his second son's wedding, a vacation, but he's a little concerned how he sustains that and does not yo-yo back and forth and keeps his eating competence level. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, first of all, I, you know, as a clinician, I'd like to know what he did <laughs> um, to actually lose that weight. Does it make a difference as to whether it was slow or whether it was some particular thing that was done? Um, from an eating competence perspective, what one would do is to make sure that you have routine meals. And uh, one of the things that helps is that you know that you're going to be eating in just a few hours later and you tell yourself that, gosh, this food tastes really good and I could probably eat a lot more of it. but I'm gonna just take a 10-minute break from eating 
and see how I feel when I'm done with that 10 minute break. Usually that is enough time for your brain to kick in and for you to get that satiety hormone start functioning. And for you to also tell yourself that in four hours I'm gonna be able to have a snack or I'm going to be eating again very soon. And I think there's nothing wrong with snacking and, um, and spreading your calories out over a day. And uh, the, the routine mealtime structure is fine. The other thing is not to yo-yo. If you happen to have a situation where, gosh, you know, that caramel corn was so good and you ate the whole bag and you didn't even realize you were going to do it, it doesn't mean that you now need to starve yourself the next day. That you just pick up then and you start eating the next day as though you're just going to try to maintain your weight. Of course, physical activity plays a huge role um, in terms of, of not only of using calories, but in terms of feeling active and feeling better and getting the, the endorphins and getting some of those hormones that we know help with the decreased depression and helping elevate the spirit, the, the mood. So I, I would say that it's to not, not go into a strict diet, not, not uh, decide to restrain yourself, um, but to, to focus on these tenets of eating confidence. In fact, look at them, put them on your refrigerator and look at them uh, as guidelines for how you could eat. Thank you, that's great advice I think for all of us and um, well appreciated. Well, unfortunately that's all the time that we have right now, but we'll take additional questions. They could be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu or tweeted to at rit underscore alumni.